This week on ANN, a new campus for the Adventist Churches College in Fiji. Public health outreach at the Sochi Olympics. And Adventist humanitarians in Zimbabwe help evacuate flooded communities. These stories and more coming up. This is ANN, a service of the Seventh day Adventist World Church. Thanks so much for joining us this week. First in the news, classes at Fulton College's new campus in Sabato, Fiji, are scheduled to begin in March. Hundreds of people were on hand to celebrate the school's launch earlier this month, including Ted Wilson. The Adventist World Church president cut the ribbon at the official opening. The new campus includes student and staff housing, classrooms, an administration block, and multi-purpose center. Fulton College was built in 1940 near Fiji's capital, Suva, on land that was later reclassified as an indigenous reserve. After legal disputes with traditional landowners, church leaders decided to relocate the school. Fulton College has helped serve the education needs of Fiji for more than a century. Administrators say its new location, 15 minutes from the Nadi International Airport, is ideal. International students now make up more than half of the school's enrollment. Public health students and faculty from the Adventist International Institute of Advanced Studies in the Philippines were part of a health expo in Silang last month to honor the birthday of a local mayor. The medical outreach team offered lifestyle and dietary assessment under the motto, A Life Worth Celebrating. They checked blood pressure, body mass index, blood sugar and offered healthy lifestyle counseling. Faculty members said the health expo was an opportunity to impact the community. The university is a regular participant in the annual event. A graduate of the Adventist International Institute of Advanced Studies also made headlines in Russia this month. A public health alumnus from the university organized a health expo in Sochi during the Olympics. Andrei Prokopioff and a team of volunteers offered blood pressure screenings and biological age analysis to Sochi residents and Olympic fans in town for the Games. They also took the opportunity to help raise awareness of the dangers of tobacco and alcohol. Studies now indicate that one in eight deaths in Russia is linked to high consumption of alcohol. Prokopioff said the Olympics are an ideal setting to inspire people to embrace healthier lifestyles. It is new start for many people. Squid cigarette and also thinking about their health. Because sport, it is health. Health, it is sport. Adventist humanitarians are supporting the evacuation of thousands of families in central Zimbabwe after torrential rains led to the partial collapse of an unfinished dam on the Tokwe River. Local observers say water continues to build up in a huge reservoir behind the dam, triggering widespread flooding upstream and threatening more than 60,000 families downstream. The Adventist Development and Relief Agency is helping thousands of families move from the flood basin to higher ground at the Chingwizi Camp for Displaced People. ADRA officials in Zimbabwe say there is an urgent need for sanitation facilities and clean water at the camp to prevent the spread of disease. Another concern is the lack of schools near the camp. Discussions are underway to establish temporary classrooms to keep students from falling behind during the first term of a new year. Adventist health professionals and outreach leaders called for a rebranding of the church's traditional medical missionary work at this year's North American Health Ministry Summit in the U.S. state of Florida. They say comprehensive health ministry can bring healing and wholeness to churches and communities worldwide. This year's summit outlined sample ministry roles for health professionals, pastors, educators, young people, and Adventist community services. Comprehensive health ministry follows Christ's method of meeting physical needs before spiritual ones. Adventists in Jamaica say the proposed amendment of labor laws in the country could discriminate against religious employees. Adventists and representatives from other Sabbath-keeping congregations in Jamaica called on legislators not to pass the Flexible Work Arrangement Bill until religiously observant employees are guaranteed a full 24-hour day of worship. The bill would allow employers and employees to negotiate a flexible work week as long as no single work period exceeds 12 hours. Adventists are worried non-traditional work weeks could encroach on Sabbath hours. Everett Brown, president of the Adventist Church in Jamaica, said no employer should have the right to determine whether an employee works or worships on any given day. The bill is scheduled for vote in Parliament at the end of March. And finally in the news this week, the president of the Adventist Church's trans-European region has announced plans to retire in July. Bertil Wicklander has led the church in Central and Northern Europe for nearly two decades. 
In a statement, Wicklander said he leaves the position with much gratitude to God and my colleagues. Wicklander provided leadership during a time marked by two realignments of church territory. Colleagues say he helped the church in Europe redefine its mission, vision, and purpose. Adventist World Church President Ted Wilson will chair a committee to elect Wicklander's successor. Coming up, is the Bible's description of judgment at odds with a compassionate God? An Adventist theologian weighs in. I grew up in a family with four children, right? When you have that many siblings, it's easy for somebody to be always taking your things, stealing your property. It's your books, your toys, seconds at the dinner table or the comfortable chair in front of the TV. It became our custom to throw our hands up in the air and put boundaries around our things and scream, this is all my property. Go get your own stuff. It's an interesting idea, ownership. What belongs to me? What belongs to you? How do we know? Everything belongs to God. Everything. Not some things or some people or some parts of the world or some planets or some galaxies. Everything. Everything belongs to God. So everything belongs to God and then God asks us to join in caretaking, taking care of each other, of our earth, our resources, our potential. I've always thought this is terribly risky on God's part. Why not just throw up your arms and mark off your property and take care of it yourself? No, God asks us to get involved. The longer I do life with God, the less I realize I don't have a right to things or people. I do have a responsibility. I sense a shift from competition to cooperation. You know what? This is a much larger and rewarding way to live life. Welcome back. The March issue of Ministry Magazine explores the intersection of God's love and justice. Willie Hux has this preview. For hundreds of years, the belief has existed that God has already predetermined who will be saved and who will be lost. Theologians refer to this concept as predestination. Many people, and I am one of them, find this concept troublesome. If God has already decided that I will be saved, then what stops me from practicing a sinful lifestyle? After all, I'll be saved regardless. If God has already decided that I will be eternally lost, then why try to live a life that pleases God? After all, I'll be lost. In Ministry Magazine's lead article for March, Kim Papa Ioannou presents an in-depth biblical study of predestination, revealing to us a God who wishes for everyone to be saved and who extends himself completely with that goal in mind. For thousands of years, Christians and others have been comfortable with the notion of a caring, compassionate, and loving God, but have remained uncomfortable with the thought that God also stands as a judge. Many find the thought of judgment ominous, something to be avoided at all costs. In the first of a two-part series, Joanne Davidson helps us see that God's judgment is designed to deal with issues of sin. We often are the ones who personalize divine justice as a wrath-filled attack upon sinners. God's justice and love are inseparable. We should be grateful that God is a God who engages in the process of righting all wrongs. Among the other excellent articles in the upcoming ministry, Daniel Shisto provides a thought-provoking study of the concept of repentance in light of Job's experience. Why would someone whom God declared to be blameless and upright in the beginning of the story need to repent at the end of the story? As always, we hope you will be blessed as you read each issue of ministry. Adventists believe church co-founder Ellen White was inspired by God during her ministry. On this month's feature from the White Estate, Chantelle Klingbal explores to what extent a prophet's own words and experiences help shape God's messages. What is inspiration? How did God inspire people to write the Bible? Or what about a modern day prophet such as Ellen White? How did God inspire her? Some believe that the writings of the prophets are the exact verbatim words as spoken to them by God. This is referred to as verbal inspiration. 
as if a manager was dictating a message to his assistant who writes it out exactly as it is spoken. In this case, the prophet is simply used as a pen to put the words down in ink. Others believe that the prophets were inspired by the Holy Spirit through dreams and visions, but used their own words in their own language. This kind of inspiration is known as thought inspiration. In this case, the prophet is more than a simple pen. The prophet writes God's messages in his or her own words, colored by individual style and experience. So how did Ellen White experience the process of being God's messenger? She says, I am as dependent upon the Spirit of the Lord in writing my views as I am in receiving them. Yet, the words I employ in describing what I've seen are my own, unless they be those spoken to me by an angel, which I always enclose in marks of quotation. To assume that God has used his prophets as his pen, bypassing their individuality to take dictation, would make the prophets little more than robots. A robot can be programmed, but it cannot be inspired. God doesn't use robots. He uses people. He works through his prophets using their unique voices and lives molded by him to receive his visions and take his message to others. A movie that illustrates the biblical account of creation is now available in four languages and new languages are coming every week. Arnaud Leclerc has more on this week's edition of Keep It Real. Creation. The Earth is a Witness is a 26-minute film produced by the headquarters of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Henry Stauber, filmmaker and photographer from Germany, traveled the world for five years, gathering amazing footage of nature for a film about God's creation. I went in about five continents, uh, more than 70 countries. Um, the footage I shot were mainly for the first days in Iceland. I, I went there numerous times. Uh, a lot of material I captured in Africa, South America, Asia, Australia, Europe. And I had a privilege just traveling around. This is the great thing. Those experiences I cannot share, but I can share the outcome, the footage, that was captured there, sometimes waiting for days, sometimes waiting for weeks to get the right shot. And not all the, the, sh the footage I shot, uh, not all the footage in the video I shot, I also bought some clips that was necessary because after all, I did photography for many, many years. So in total, I traveled the world for, ar for around 15 years, but that footage which is in the movie is done on a period of about the six and a half years. Vegetation. This film will be soon available in 99 different languages. To view this film and download it, visit daretobelieve.com. You can watch an extended version of this interview at vimeo.com slash channel slash keep it real. The book Beyond Imagination answers questions about the universe and human existence from a new perspective. Pacific Press Publishing Association sent this month's ANN book review. Beyond Imagination explores the wonders of God's creation, the incredible vastness of the universe, the astounding marvels here on this earth, and the intricate complexity of the human body. This book describes not just the wonders of life around us, but the wonders of our own existence. Beyond Imagination shares with the reader the relevancy and urgency of the first angel's message. The Creator is coming soon to judge the earth. Although sin has marred God's handiwork, He will restore His creation through the wonderful plan of salvation. Beyond Imagination addresses the big questions that people have struggled with throughout history. Our missionary book for 2014, Beyond Imagination, will take the reader on a journey of discovery answering the deepest questions of the human heart and revealing a remarkable love that is beyond imagination. 
Adventist professors at Monte Morales University in Mexico shared how the Bible informs their teaching at a recent conference. Lisa Beardsley Hardy reports. We recently completed a conference at Montemorelos University in Mexico. Montemorelos University is one of the sites for a medical school, and it also has schools of education, music, and other areas. The conference was a unique one in that the entire campus participated, all the teachers in all of the disciplines, and even administration, the president, the vice president, the president's wife. We spent the mornings reviewing the biblical foundations for Adventist education. How can we know what is true? And then there were some presentations on specific areas like science and faith. And what about political science or history and the Bible? In the afternoons, there were panels and workshops during which the participants reviewed and sat with the presenters who critiqued their papers. They wrote papers about how the Bible informs their teaching, whatever that discipline is. It might be music, or it could be history, or it could be educational administration. Then it concluded with each of the participants, each of the teachers, presenting this to all of their peers. This conference was an inspiration to me to see how individuals with such expertise in their own areas took the Bible very seriously, studied it deeply, and then applied it to their own area, Montemorelos University in Mexico. Still ahead, advice on respecting a married couple's decision not to have children. But up next, tips on making your website load faster. A child wondering where her next meal will come from. A woman without a home, forced to sleep in the street. A forgotten grandparent with no familiar face to brighten their day. A family unable to care for their everyday needs. People that we pass every day, but have stopped seeing. It's a human problem. Today or 2,000 years ago, in Uganda or America, China or Brazil. Instead of passing by, what would happen if we, Seventh-day Adventist youth, stopped and helped? If each of us in our own corner of the world reached out to those in need and made a difference in being the hands and feet of Jesus? On Sabbath, March 16th, 2013, we tried an experiment. Instead of going to church, we, the Adventist youth, went out and lived the sermon in our towns, in our countries, in our world. In 24 hours, 8 million youth made an impact in others' lives, bringing the gospel to our communities through acts of kindness. This year, we can do more. We spend most of our Sabbath studying what it means to be followers of Christ. It's time to take one Sabbath and live out the sermon. This year, we can touch a life. We can transform a community. We can change the world. Now let's turn to John Beckett for this week's Tech Corner. When we create websites, we want to make them load quickly and look good for our visitors. Today we'll explore a few simple things you can do to make your site work better. The biggest problem for many sites is that photos are not resized or compressed well for the web. In Word, we learn to resize by grabbing and dragging from the corner. But for the web, you need to include a picture that has already been saved at a size close to what you plan to use. Web content management systems like NetAventist sometimes handle this resizing automatically, but many do not. News feeds and other boxes on your site that load information from other websites can also slow your page down. Try turning them off to see if your page loads more quickly. Newer website themes often include responsive design, which makes them look really nice on a variety of screen sizes. Check your site on a mobile phone to make sure it looks and works well. 
For more in-depth view of how your website performs, I recommend Google Chrome's developer tools and the free website performance tool called YSlow. The views that show element sizes and page load timeline are very helpful. Use them to find things that load slowly and Google search for how to improve them. I found that changing a few things can often hugely improve how well a website works for visitors. Adventist Family Ministry leaders say married couples without children can sometimes feel alienated from the church family. They have advice this week on including non-traditional families in worship and fellowship. Our churches are invariably filled or at least have couples who are married who have no children. Sometimes five years or ten years or fifteen years or even twenty years. And invariably we find that these couples feel uh, a level of isolation, alienation from the church family. Many people think that perhaps they don't want to have children or they're selfish or they're narcissistic. Other people just simply don't invite them. You know, they invite other couples with children like, like themselves and often couples who are childless get marginalized in churches. What should we do with this? What should be our approach? Yeah, well the first thing I think a church family needs to do is to be just that, a family. And so in family, we love each other, we nurture each other, we care for each other. And there are certain things that we want to be careful of, that we don't um, pry into areas that's really not a part of our concern. Yes. Um, and we can um, still love people and embrace them without getting into their business. We also need to be very careful about not asking insensitive questions. I think it's too easy to continue to say to a couple, when are you going to have children? And, and you have no idea that they may be infertile. And you have no idea that they may be infertile. Also, a couple may make the decision not to have kids, and that decision needs to be respected as well and not treat them as if they are just People with outsiders, leprosy. right? Yeah. And one last thing I wanted to say, it's really important to invite childless couples home, even if they don't have kids, because it's, there's a tendency to only invite families that look exactly the way our own families look. The reality is, we're the people of God, we're the church of God. We need to be family. Everyone is family in church. Whether you have children or not, whether you're married or not, Let's just be family. Let's be kind. Let's be compassionate like Jesus so our church can be strong and we can reach out with love to our community. Now let's turn to David Trim for a look at Adventist history. This week, an education community in the southern U.S. grows with the launch of a small Adventist academy. Welcome to This Week in Adventist History. On February 20, in 1892, a new Adventist academy opened in Graysville, Tennessee, with 23 students. Graysville Academy is notable because four years later in 1896 the school reopened as a general conference institution the Southern Industrial School. In 1901 it became the Southern Training School and in 1944 it became a higher education institution as Southern Missionary College, today's Southern Adventist University, which has over 3,000 students. On February 25, 1876, Michael Belina Tchaikovsky died in Vienna, capital city of Austria. Tchaikovsky, a Pole, had been a Catholic priest in early life, but became disillusioned with Roman Catholicism, married, and emigrated to the USA. There, in 1857, he accepted the Seventh-day Sabbath, and soon after began work as an Adventist minister. In 1863, he asked leaders of the recently founded Seventh-day Adventist Church to send him as a missionary to Europe, but they felt this was a step too far for the embryonic denomination. Tchaikovsky then went himself in 1864, 150 years ago this year and 10 years before J. N. Andrews was sent as our church's first official missionary, and Tchaikovsky worked independently in Europe over the next 12 years. Tchaikovsky had many character faults and made many mistakes, and his work bore only limited fruit, but his commitment to the third angel's message was wholehearted. That was This Week in Adventist History. 
Thanks for watching ANN. Join us next week for more news from the headquarters of the Seventh day Adventist Church. In the meantime, find us on Facebook. You can connect with other Adventists worldwide and find links to more stories, photos, and videos. Just visit Facebook slash Adventist News. Our good news for this week comes from the New Testament book of John. The passage says, The Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. We have seen His glory, the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. That's our program for this week. And remember, you can always visit news.adventist.org for daily news and videos. Until next time, God bless. Take care.